Good morning. Thank you for being here today. If this is your first time with us, we hope you will fill out a Connect card. The Women of Grace are invited to meet in the Fellowship Hall after the 11 a.m. service today for United, United Women of Faith meeting. Refreshments will be available. Pastor Ben will make a presentation about General Conference today at 2 p.m. in the sanctuary. This presentation is to help people understand what General Conference is, how it functions, and how to follow the work of General Conference as it happens. General Conference meets it from April 23rd to May 3rd. We'll now have uh, the chiming of the Trinity. We shall now have the opening collect, which you can find in your bulletin. O God, whose Son Jesus is the God of your people, grant that when we hear his voice, we may know him who calls us each by name, and follow where he leads, to with you in the Holy Spirit, lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please get remain standing for the opening hymn.
We shall now have the affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We now invite the children of the church to come up, but here for children's time. today. Good. I want to talk to you about something this morning. I want to talk about sharing. Do you guys like to share? Yeah. Only, my food. Only your food? Yeah. You do like to share food? Oh, he doesn't eat anything. Well, it's easy to share if you don't want it, I guess. What do you like to share? Uh, toys. Toys, yeah. I feel like when you are a kid, you hear a lot that it's important to share. Is that something you guys feel like you get told a lot? You share with your cousins, that's nice. So what's something that you guys get told to share a lot? What do you think? What do you get told to share, Dylan? I get to share, I get to share um, my video games. You have to share video games? Do you have to share a lot? What do you have to share? You have to share your Nintendo Switch with your brother. Oh man, that's tough, that's a tough one. Uh, so. I feel like we hear a lot that it's important to share our stuff, to take turns with all the fun things that we're doing, or even to share the attention of people we want to talk to, but have any of you guys ever heard that it's important to share Jesus? Yes. What? Do you guys know what it means to share Jesus? No? no? That's a fair answer. What? To share, love. to share his love. Let me ask you a question. Who is somebody that you would really, really, really like to meet? Like, okay, maybe a musician or an actor or an athlete that if they walked in the room right now, you would be like, so excited. Who, who you got? Taylor. I knew you were gonna say it. As soon as I saw your hand up, I knew it was Taylor Swift. Was that you, same answer? Anybody else? What about you, Dylan? Um, mine would be. Yours would be Jesus. Okay, well talk's over, guys, we're done. That's it. <laughs> we're all excited to meet Jesus. Good answer, Dylan. What's, what you got? Who would you be excited to see? Patrick Mahomes. Patrick Mahomes. All right, cool. We're keeping it in the Kansas City family. All right. Um, so I bet if you guys met someone that famous, if Taylor Swift or Patrick Mahomes walked in that door right now, Monday morning, what's the first thing you guys are talking to your friends about? I saw Taylor Swift, exactly, right. You would be so excited, you would tell your friends and anybody who would sit still long enough to hear it, right? That is actually what happened when Jesus started his ministry on earth. John the Baptist was one of the first people to realize who Jesus was and how important he was. He was so excited, he stopped what he was doing. He was pointing him out to other people and told them they were looking at the Son of God. Those people ran after Jesus and when they met him, they knew who he was and they were so excited to tell others about it too. It's what happened in the early church. 
after his death and resurrection, people were so excited to share the news with others, they couldn't stop telling people about it. The knowledge of who Jesus was and all the amazing things he had done was something they didn't want to keep to themselves. They had to share it. And did you guys know that it's actually our job to share that love of God with one another? Our goal as children of God is to tell other people about him. We want to spread the good news of the gospel and make more disciples. As excited as you might be to tell your friends if you saw Taylor Swift walking in the door, we <laughs> that excited, bring that energy right there. We should be just as excited to tell people the good news of Jesus. It's something that gives us so much joy and hope that we should really want to share it with everyone. We want other people to know God's love too, and we are going to go to Children's Church and talk about some of the ways we can do that. But first, I think Rylan, oh no, come here, I'll fix it. Rylan is going to lead us in the Lord's Prayer. So if you guys would all, yeah. Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. So, my friends, I just want to explain some of what's going on today because we have different people doing some different things. Um, today is Youth Sunday, and we are celebrating that the youth love Jesus so much. They are willing to step out of their comfort zone and do different things to help lead worship from greeting and ushering to being the liturgist and different things. So we are grateful for the youth because they are the future of the church. Amen? So if you get a chance, well, yes, you, you can applaud for the, the, the youth. Um, more important, though, than just clapping, which is a good thing to recognize them, thank them. When you see one of them after worship, let them know that you appreciate their love of Jesus. Amen? Amen. We also have the fact that Pastor Kim has earned a well-earned day off, so she is not with us. So to lead the congregational prayer, we have Roxanne, who I'm going to invite to come up. She's going to lead us in a congregational prayer. And while she comes up, I want to let you know that this prayer, she prayed at our prayer service that we had on Tuesday. And everybody that was here on Tuesday felt the power of the Holy Spirit. And I heard a lot of wonderful feedback from everybody that was here. I encourage you, uh, if you just want some Jesus goosebumps, if you want to experience some power in prayer. Uh, next time we have a prayer service, I encourage you just to circle that date on your calendar and make it a priority to be here because God will be here in the worship and we hope you will be too. But Roxanne, will you please lead us in a congregational prayer? Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for Grace United Methodist Church. We thank you for our longtime members and their faithful dedication. We thank you for our new members and their fresh enthusiasm. Lord, we pray that we will all work together to be some kind of blessing to our West Ashley community. We pray your blessings upon our men, our women, our youth and children, our church council, our weekday school, our Sunday school, our choirs, our musicians, and all of our committees. 
We thank you, Lord, for the staff you have blessed us with and pray that you will continue to lead and guide each one as they serve this church with their gifts and their talents. We pray for all who come through these doors for whatever reason, and we thank you because you deliver your word and your blessings to each of us here week after week, no matter who we are or what we're going through. Our souls are fed through Grace Church. Lead us and guide us and continue to glorify your kingdom through this congregation of the United Methodist Church. Lord, we thank you for annual conference coming in June and for our long awaited general conference happening next week in Charlotte. We pray for every delegate, every issue, every vote, and our hearts are grateful that we don't have to worry about what's gonna happen because we know that you are in control. Our trust is in you, Lord. Our faith is in you. We love you, Lord. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Roxanne. This time, I'm going to call on the ushers to come forward to gather our tithes, our gifts, and our offerings as the choir leads us in an anthem.
Father, we are grateful that we are able to give this offering back to you. It is in your abundance you give to us, and it is in our response to your love that we give back to you. We pray that you will take these gifts, just as you take each of us and use us in this offering to grow your kingdom here on earth, where your justice, your mercy, your peace, and your love reign over all. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus, the resurrected Christ. Amen. Beloved of the Lord, please remain standing and join in as we celebrate our next hymn. Please be seated. Just as a reminder, we always stand as a sign of reverence for the Gospels, knowing that all Scripture is important, but the Gospels are set apart, so we stand for those. But today's Scripture lesson comes to us from the book of Acts. We are in the fourth chapter, starting at verse 32. Today's lesson says, Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possession. But everything they had was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was no needy person among them, for as many as owned land or houses sold them and brought their proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. There was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him, and then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Good and gracious God, as we gather here in this place, we are many and we are all in different places in our journeys of faith. But no matter what, we are all seeking after you, Lord. So we pray that you will speak to us, Lord, once again through this worship service, through the prayers, through the music, and through the spoken word. 
Help each of us to hear what it is that you would say to each of us to challenge us to be just a little bit more faithful to you. Father, as a preacher, I pray that you will speak in me and through me. And Lord, if it be necessary, please speak in spite of me. So that no matter what, each of us may encounter you this day. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, so I want to start with a question. I want you to, to, to think of the most recent restaurants that you went to for the first time. Time. I want you to think of the, the most recent three restaurants that you went to for the first time. And if it's a chain, it doesn't count. Just because you went to a new Waffle House, that doesn't count because you've already been to a Waffle House. I want you to think of a, a new restaurant. You've never been to it before, and you walked in. So as you think of the last three times, or the most recent three times that's happened, I want you to also contemplate why you went to that restaurant. Maybe you went because you were traveling in, in, in a new place and it just happened to be the thing that was right there. Or maybe you passed it as you drove by and there was a big grand opening sign and you thought, well, let's give this a try. There are many reasons why people will try a, a new restaurant, but I imagine many of us try new restaurants more often than not because somebody else recommended it. So let's just see. I see some heads nodding. So if at least one of the most recent three restaurants that you tried for the first time, you went because somebody recommended, can you say amen? amen. All right. Let's test our luck. If at least two of the restaurants that you attended for the first time, you went because somebody recommended, can you say amen? Okay, we still got some. All right, just we're, we're going to go all in. Let's see what happens. If you went to the most recent three restaurants for the first time because somebody recommended them, can you say amen? All right, there's some of us. Here's why I bring this up. We are heavily influenced by other people. Whether we realize it or not, a lot of what we do, we do because other people recommend it shapes where we go out to eat. It shapes where we go for entertainment. It shapes the clothes that we wear. It shapes the technology that we buy. It shapes the vacations we might go on. We make decisions based on feedback from other people. They tell us what they recommend or don't recommend, and it influences us. But there's a flip side to that coin. Just as we are very influenced by what other people say, you, you have the ability to influence other people. Through telling people what you think, you have the ability, whether you realize it or not, you have the ability to shape other people's lives. You can shape where they eat, what they buy, where they go on vacation, because other people whether you realize it or not, other people care what you think. So, I want to put that part of the conversation on hold for a moment. We've acknowledged that we are heavily influenced by other people, but we also can influence other people. I want to put that on hold for a moment. I want to shift gears, and I want to jump into today's scripture passage. But first, I want to give this a little bit of context just to remind us where we are in the book of Acts. Jesus is resurrected, he is ascended, and the uh, apostles, which are the disciples who have encountered the resurrected Christ. That's what apostle means. It is a disciple who has encountered the resurrected Christ. The apostles are all sitting around waiting for the Holy Spirit. That's Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 2 is Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit comes. There's tongues of flame on people's heads. They're talking in tongues. People from all over are hearing the good news of Jesus the Christ in their own native tongue. And, and, and then Peter, oh, Peter gives a sermon, y'all, and people are coming to Christ. Like, this is an amazing sermon. And people are like, I, I need what they're having. And, and, and people come to Christ because Peter preaches this amazing sermon. And that's Acts chapter 2. And now we're just in Acts chapter 3. So the church is this nascent, fledgling movement. It's this brand new thing, 
And the early church understands it is operation critical to grow the church. Now, the first reason the church wants to grow is because the church understands it's in other people's best interest to receive the good news of Jesus the Christ and to come to Christ. Like, we, we too, to this day, should understand that we want to reach other people because it's in their best interest. Whether they realize it or not, they need what we have in Christ Jesus. So we want to reach other people. But there's also this logistical reality that the more people who are a part of the church, the stronger the church is, the more ministry the church can do to transform this world into the kingdom that God created it to be. So it's a win-win situation. So the church 2,000 years ago understood that we need to grow the church. So there is, like we just acknowledged, Paul, or Peter, Peter, sorry, Peter preaching this great sermon and, and, and people coming to Christ. But that's not the only way the church grows. To this day, we still need Billy Graham's of the world to go out and preach an evangelistic message so other people realize, oh, I need a savior. I can't pull myself up by my own bootstraps. I need Jesus. Like we need those preachers that can go out and preach those sermons, but that's not the only way the church grows. The other way that the church grows is disciples giving their testimony. In this passage, what we see is the apostles, once again, which are just disciples who have encountered the resurrected Christ, they're going around telling people how they encountered the resurrected, the resurrected Christ and how that transformed their lives, and they're giving their testimony, and other people are coming to Christ as a result. We started today by acknowledging that we, you, have the ability to influence other people. You can influence where they eat, where they go, what they buy. Why not use that influence for something that they need? Why not use that influence in a way that God works through you to reach other people to give them something eternal? Why not use that influence on others by sharing your testimony with them the same way the apostles shared their testimony with others. Now, I could see it on y'all's faces. Some of you just got a little disheartened. Like, ah, oh, we're talking about testimony today? Man, can't he just talk about tithing or something else? Like, come on, man. And I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. I remember when I was earlier on in my journey of faith, long before I went to, to seminary, that sometimes a preacher would talk about testimony, and because I was insecure in my journey of faith, and I didn't really understand what testimony is, I, I was like, oh man, can't we just not talk about this? I'm really uncomfortable. Isn't this stuff like the other denominations do? Do we have to do this too? There is power in a testimony. And what we want to do as a church is help God work through you to reach others through your testimony. Your testimony is God's gospel in action today being played out through your life. And when you can give your testimony, there is power in it so other people can come to Christ. So to help you as you your testimony. We have a little insert in your bulletin. You don't have to get it out now, but uh, you, you can. I know a lot of people uh, recycle your bulletins after worship. That's okay. You can do that. Uh, a lot of people take them home, though, because they like the announcements and the prayers and the, all of that. Uh, but regardless of what you do with the bulletin, please take the insert home and pray over it. Just pray over it. When you are preparing your testimony and praying over how do I even start your testimony starts by answering three fundamental questions. First, what did your life look like before God got more involved? Two, what led you to let God get more involved in your life? Three, how is your life different because God is more involved in your life? 
So a lot of times we think of testimony for people who were not Christian, whether they were not Christian from birth or maybe they were baptized, but then they wandered away from the faith and, and had to come back. But uh, the, usually people think of, well, there's a time when I was outside of the faith and then I came to Christ at this moment because this thing happened and now my life is so much different and so much better. And there is power in those stories. Those testimonies are life-giving to people. But that's not the only way to give a testimony. A testimony is not just for people who were outside of the faith and came to Christ. A testimony is about an inflection moment in a journey of faith where God did something. See, in your journey of faith, even if you were baptized as a child, confirmed as a teenager, and you've always been Christian, you've only missed five Sundays in your entire life, even when you're on vacation, you go to another church, even if that's you and you've always been Christian, in your journey of faith, you should be growing in your journey of faith. And so your testimony is just what happened to let you allow God to be more involved in your life. So for some people, it might sound something like this. I've been a Christian my entire life. I, I go to church, go to Sunday school. I even sat on a committee or two. But then... My church decided to read the Bible cover to cover one year. And the Bible, which I always found a little scary, a little confusing, and a little distant from me, I said, you know what, I'm going to read this. And I read it with, with the rest of the church, and it was powerful because the, 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 the Bible went from being this scary book that I didn't quite understand to being my story about how God is moving in my life and how I can learn to be more obedient to his will. And it's changed everything about me. Or another testimony that's been had by many a Christian. People will say something like, I've been Christian my entire life. Once again, went to church all the time, sat on a committee. But then one day somebody came to me and said, you need to go on the walk to Emmaus. And I thought, I don't know if I want to do that. But I went anyway. And I realized that in my entire journey of faith, I had tried to be the pilot of my own life and let Jesus be my co-pilot. And the walk to Emmaus helped me understand that that's backwards. And when I needed to switch seats and let Jesus be the Lord of my life. Let Jesus be the pilot. Let Jesus make the decisions. And my life has completely changed forevermore. My relationships are better. My health is better. My finances are better. My outlook on life is better. Everything is better because he's in charge, not me. So maybe that's your testimony. There are a lot of different options, but, but, but it's just answering these three questions. No matter where you are in your journey of faith, no matter where you've been or where you're going, where were you before God got more involved? What led you to let God get more involved? And how has that changed you? So, your testimony is a prepared statement. Ecclesiastes reminds us there's a time and a place for everything. There are some conversations that are just off the cuff, a stream of consciousness. That's not your testimony. Your testimony is a very prepared statement where you know what you're going to say so you can say it well. And the more time you spend preparing your testimony, the more time you are giving the Holy Spirit to work on you and your testimony to refine it so it can be even more powerful and potent for people to receive. So, you want to practice your testimony. You want to figure out what are these three questions, and you want to work on articulating the answers to those three questions and say it again and again and again and again. Say it when you're driving in the car. Say it when you're sitting in your office by yourself. Say it, say it to your family. Say it to your friends. Say it to your Sunday school class, wherever. But practice it. Because once again, the more refined you let this get by, by, by re repeating it and letting the Holy Spirit influence you, the more powerful it can be. And the more you will see, God will open doors for you to give your testimony. So the same way, with ease and comfort, you can say, oh, you, you want to go to that restaurant, or you want to buy this kind of cell phone. To be able to say, can I tell you something about my life? 
how Jesus makes all the difference. So, when you're practicing, I know some people are allergic to a clock when it comes to public speaking. Please don't be. Get a clock out. We got clocks on every place we got. Like there's clocks on walls. There's clocks on your wrist. There's clocks on your phone. Get a stopwatch out. And, and, and just as you're talking through your testimony, it should be three minutes or less. You want your testimony to be three minutes or less. If it takes you longer than three minutes to give your testimony, you're saying too much. It's three questions. And I know, depending upon your personality type, like, I, I love engineers and architects and doctors and all these people who just love them some details. They make a living just wading through minutia and details. And I love that. But please, there's a time and a place for everything. Your testimony is not the details. It's Jesus, the big picture. So use as many details as you need to, to, to answer the three questions, but not a detail more. You want to, once again, tighten it up because the, 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 the tighter it is, the easier it is for people to receive. And one of the reasons you want your testimony to be three minutes or less is because you might give your testimony to somebody who's not ready to receive it yet. And being Christian is about caring about others. It's not about me. It's not me just saying what I want to say so I feel good. It's about me saying something so someone else can receive it. They are the priority. And if you are giving your testimony to somebody who's not ready to receive it, and you're just droning on for five to six minutes or longer, that, that might harden their heart towards you. And by accident, you might harden their heart towards Jesus. Be careful with other people's time. Keep it to three minutes or less, because if you do a good job, they're going to ask questions. And that's by design, because once you can engage in the questions, then you can really get into all those fun details and all that minutia and all that stuff that you left out. People will want to know. Your three-minute testimony is not the end of the conversation. It's to start the conversation. So use a clock. Practice, practice, practice. Lucid brevity uses as many words as you have to to say what you need to say, but then don't use an extra word. And please, know this. There is a rookie mistake that especially us preachers make all the time. So if preachers are going to make this and we are trained to talk for a living about Jesus, anybody can make this mistake. One of the rookie mistakes you will see people making is when they go to talk about how great God is in their life, they will say it in a way that makes themselves look good. And we want to remember the Bible. The Bible is important. Paul is very clear about this. If we're going to boast, we're going to boast in what the Lord is doing. We're not going to boast in ourselves. So as you practice your testimony and you say it to other people, just ask them, what did you hear? And if somebody says, I heard that you are amazing. <laughs> That's not a testimony. A testimony should be as clear as day that it's not about us, it's about him. It's about the power of God in action in people's lives today. It's a story that we can tell that's true that helps other people see that God can move in their lives too. So, as your pastor, I would love to help you with your testimony. I, I, I am very fortunate only because God got me through it. I was able to get a, a master's of divinity. Uh, and, and that is a, a graduate level degree that focuses on three things. Theology, pastoral care, and public speaking. All of those things can be really helpful when crafting your testimony. So if you want to sit down with me, like, let's grab lunch, let's grab coffee, let's just hang out here in the sanctuary and chit chat. Like, let's talk. I would love to help you as, as, as you shape your testimony. Now, we as a church are going to invite you as you see fit to share your testimony at Grace. I want to be clear here. The purpose of a testimony is not to give it necessarily to the people who already know Jesus. That's not a bad thing, but that's not the fundamental thing. Fundamentally, you want to be able to give your, your testimony to people who don't know Jesus yet or have forgotten about Jesus. So, 
With that being said, it is still good for us to share our testimony in worship because it gives God the glory for what God's doing in our lives. And it might help somebody else in the congregation hear how they can give their testimony. So if you're at a place where you're like, all right, preacher, I got your three minutes. Let's go. I want to give my testimony in worship. Yeah, buddy, come on. Here's what's going to happen. You're going to sit down with me first. What we're going to do is just meet somewhere. I'm going to get a clock out because, once again, the clock is your friend, I promise. Um, But I'm going to hear your testimony. Because as a Methodist preacher, before we do something in worship, I just want to help you. Maybe, maybe your time and prayerful preparation is so flawless. When you give your testimony, I'll say, Dad is two thumbs up. I can't do any better. That might happen. Or it's possible I might have some loving advice just to say, I think it might help you to say it this way or to focus on this part, not that part, just to help you accomplish your goal of making him known and making him famous. So if you want to give your testimony, talk to me. We'll work on your testimony, make sure that it's where we want it to be, and then we'll schedule a Sunday that works for you to, to be in worship so that you can share your testimony so that somebody else might hear how they can craft their testimony. Because here's the thing, getting back to the scripture passage. The church grows when the preachers preach an evangelistic message and people come to Christ. That's important. To this day, we still need preachers like Billy Graham to go out there and and reach the, the multitudes and say, come to Jesus, you need him and he loves you. But that's not the only way the church grows. The church grows when the disciples, like you, figure out your testimony about how you've encountered the power of a resurrected Christ in your life, and you share it with others. And I know some people might be be, be drowning in insecurities right now and discomfort. Moses didn't know what to say. God helped them. God will help you. Remember, we talked about this before. We should fear God. Wisdom begins with fearing God. If we're going to be afraid of something, fear God. But don't fear things of this world. Our insecurities are are, are just our own fears that we're not good enough. But God doesn't see you through your insecurities. God sees you as the beautiful handcrafted creature that he created. And he wants to use you for his glory. And he will use you if you let him. So my friend. I say all of that to say this, Jesus loves you. If you only hear me say one thing, please, please, please hear me say this, Jesus loves you. And he's been active in your life whether you realize it or not. And when you can slow down long enough to figure out your testimony, to be able to tell others how God has been active in your life, you can be the olive branch of peace that somebody else needs to come to Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen and amen. Beloved of the Lord, before we go any further in worship, I invite you to stand and join as we worship God through song.
Amen. I do have two things I want to point out. Three things. First, there's two prayer shawls uh, up here. If you have time after worship, you want to just come up and read about who we're praying for and pray over them. That is power, and, and, and the world needs prayers, specifically with two people that we are lifting up in prayer today. So please feel free to pray for them. Pray over these uh, prayer shawls that they may be a tangible reminder of Christ's love and healing in the recipient's life. I just want to make sure that everybody knows that is a lady of grace, whether you're visiting for the first time or the, you're a lifetime member, um, you're welcome to be with us today, immediately following this service in the Fellowship Hall. The United Women of Faith ha have a, a general meeting. It's going to be a lot of fun. There's going to be refreshments. There's going to be ministry. It's going to be beautiful. So any lady is invited to, to join in the, the, the fun in the Fellowship Hall immediately following this service. And then today at 2, I'm going to lead a little conversation about general conference, just talk about what it is. I want to be very clear at this point. There's nothing to decide. Like, nothing's happened yet. <laughs> so we're not voting on anything. We're not deciding anything. We're not advocating for anything. All we're doing is answering questions if people want to know what in the ham sandwich is general conference and what in the ham sandwich is going on. So we're going to have that conversation. I'll be here to answer any questions you have to the best of my ability. So if you want to know more about General Conference, then by all means, I invite you to be here. If you're like, nah, I'm good, that's okay. Jesus loves you, and you don't have to be here. Um, it, it's whatever works for you. But I just want to let everybody know, like I know some people are really puckered with, with, with anxiety about General Conference. Oh, my goodness. Ah. He's still on the throne. Amen? It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. God will not be denied God's glory. God will be on the throne. It will be okay. So if you want to find out more, come on, let's have a chit-chat. But, but, but it just no matter what, know that it's going to be okay. So I invite you to receive this closing blessing. May God's grace be with you, watching over you, protecting you, and keeping you safe. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen and amen. Mm -hmm.